All right, so I want to talk a little bit about phylogeny now, or phylogenetic trees, okay? And phylogenetic trees are estimates of the relative amounts of evolutionary divergence between two organisms. Now, you might have heard of people who, um, now you might have heard of Carl Woese, who was a um, very famous biologist who came up with this idea of investigating the 16S ribosomal RNA, um, which is found in the small ribosomal subunit, and um, kind of sequencing that in order to compare the sequences between different, um, different organisms. And what he found was he found a whole new um, kingdom, essentially. He found a whole new classification and um, came up with this classification system based on this um, genetic sequencing here. So that's sort of what these phylogenetic trees are, okay? They're estimates of, you know, evolutionary divergence between organisms. So how different are we? When did we, when did we divide? When was our, la when, when did we move along on different paths? And how long ago and what, where did that common ancestor, that common ancestor between all of us, our common ancestor between plants and um, algae or something along those lines? So in relation to that, Random mutations, so we all know that mutations occur, and they occur, you know, quite often. Um, not, at, not at a very, very high rate, but they do occur. And they, and they occur usually due to errors in replication, or errors in the replication machinery. Okay, so if you have random mutations with neutral effects that are not subject to selection, they tend to accumulate at a steady rate over the generations. And that's all, again, because of errors in DNA replication. So, I mean, you know, these things are not perfect, although it's very, very close to being perfect. And, you know, that's why we don't have mutations going on all the time. You know, it's not perfect, okay? And there, there is that little bit of sort of genetic drift going on there. And that's exactly what this says. So the resulting genetic drift, you know, causes sequences to diverge over time. And that leads us to this idea of a molecular clock, okay? And a molecular clock, so as genetic molecules replicate, the number of mutations accumulated at random is proportional to the number of generations and thus the time since divergence. So all it's basically saying is that you can look at the number of mutations in the DNA, in, the case, in this case usually 16S ribosomal RNA or 18S ribosomal RNA for eukaryotes, um, and compare them. Compare the, the common sequence and see what's going on. And you could determine, you know, based on how many, how much, how many different errors there are, or how many errors there are in these DNA sequences, how much they diverge from each other, you could determine, you know, uh, an idea of when these two organisms diverge from a common ancestor. And that led to, like I said, the three domains of life. And those three domains of life are archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. All right, and that was all done by the by uh, Carl Woese, who was a very very famous biologist. So basically, what I want to do here is I want to kind of show you guys a uh, major differences in, between the domains. Okay, so what I did was I kind of set up like a little chart. I mean, it's nothing fancy, and I just kind of went through a couple of. I tried to find at least one unique property that each of these um, domains, okay, bacteria, archaea, eukarya one unique property that each of these has, okay? So I started out with a nuclear membrane. So of course, bacteria do not have a nuclear membrane, archaea do not have a nuclear membrane, but the eukaryotes do, okay? As far as membrane-bound organelles go, bacteria do not have any, archaea do not have any, but eukaryotes, again, have membrane-bound organelles. And that's due to, that's due, that's for compartmentalization. Separation of processes, separation of metabolic pathways, um, is extremely important in higher multicellular organisms. Um, the ribosomes, well, you'd be surprised bacteria have 70S ribosome, but archaea also have a 70S ribosome, and eukaryotes have the 80S ribosome, and we already went over what those things were and why they're different and why that's important. But another interesting fact here is that although archaea have a 70S ribosome, antibiotics don't work on their 70S ribosome. Okay, so that's just an interesting fact to keep in the back of your mind. If you were to try and use antibiotics that work on the 70S ribosome of bacteria on Archaea's 70S ribosome, you would find that they are ineffective. Okay, but also, it, you know, you might say, well, why would you? Because there are no known pathogens for Archaea. Okay, they're, no, they're not pathogenic, which means they're not disease-causing, essentially. 
Um, the next thing I talk about is this peptidylglycan, glycan, or peptidylglycan. I'm trying to pronounce it correctly for you guys. Um, anyway, bacteria do have this, and this is in their cell wall, as I mentioned before, and it's um, it's got a protein component and a polysaccharide component, and essentially these they form long polymers of polysaccharide with alternating uh, monomers, and those groups are um, N as I believe it's acetyl glucosamine and N-acetyl um, muramic acid okay those are the two groups and they alternate they form a long polymer and um, the polymers are cross-linked or, or, or have cross bridges that are made of proteins okay that link them together essentially and that's structural we're talking about structural here this provides structural support it prevents the cell it prevents bacterial cells from lysing in the event that they're in a hypertonic um, environment you know um, so that's essentially what what they're for they also give the defined shape like you'll see people talk about cocci bacteria or bacilli or um, spherical I mean um, you know or there's various different kinds, but cocci and bacilli are kind of the main ones. Anyway, so they have it. Archaea do not. Eukaryotes do not. Okay, and the lipids. This is interesting also. Um, there's ester-linked lipids, which what I'm saying there is that when you talk about a fat, you know that it has a glycerol backbone usually, and then attached to that glycerol backbone is the three fatty acid chains. Well, those are attached by ester bonds, okay, in the case of bacteria and eukaryotes. But they are not attached by ester bonds in the case of archaea. They're actually ether-linked. And the interesting fact about that is that these ether-linked um, lipids are actually a lot stronger. And it makes sense because archaea are generally found in very, very harsh conditions. They're found in extremes in temperature, extremes in pH, conditions that other organisms, including bacteria and eukaryotes, wouldn't be able to survive. Okay, plain and simple. And one of the things that helps them to survive is these ether-linked um, lipids. Okay.